Good morning, everyone. This is our second week, and we've changed the location. You saw my coach. That's as much as you got to see. We're in the church now, and that's going to work out well, we hope. This Sunday coming, which will be when you watch this, is Palm Sunday. It's something we celebrate. It's something special to all Christians. It's Christ's triumphant entry. So we're going to turn to, if you have your Bibles out, to Matthew 21, 1 through 11. Jesus comes to Jerusalem as the king. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you will find the donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter Zion, see your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Now, one thing odd about that is why was everyone outside of the city so knowledgeable to who Jesus was? And those that were in the city didn't know. They had to ask to find out. But more so than that, why is this one of the most interesting and astonishing passages in the Bible? And that's what we're going to look at today. Number one, the infrutability document, the book of Daniel. Now, that's the prophet referred to in Math, Matthew uh, 21, 4 that we just read. That <clears throat> he is of the Old Testament, and it's translated into Greek prior to 270 BC. This portion is all being changed and translated into Greek 270 years before Christ is born. Several centuries before Christ was born. This is a well-established fact in secular history. It's called the Septuagint. After his conquest of Bab the Babylonian Empire, Alexander the Great promoted the Greek language throughout the known world, and thus almost everyone, including the Jews, spoke Greek. He he <clears throat> Hebrew fell into disuse. Now, this was a very accurate language. It was the ac actual language of the time, and this was a major change that took place and this is 270 years, remind you, before Christ. In order to make the Jewish scriptures, what we call the Old Testament, available to the average Jewish reader, a project was undertaken under the sponsorship of Ptolemy II to translate the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. Seventy scholars were commissioned to complete this work, and as a result, it is known as the Septuagint, or 70, Septuagint meaning 70, translation. The book of Daniel is actually one of the most authenticated books of the Old Testament, historically and archaeologically. It is critical to realize that the book of Daniel existed in documents for almost three centuries before Christ was born. Excuse me. Now, here's Gabriel's zinger. Daniel, originally deported as a teenager, now near the end of the Babylonian captivity, 
was reading in the book of Jeremiah, he understood that 70 years of servitude were almost over and he began to pray for his people. The angel Gabriel interrupted Daniel's prayer and gave him four verses of prophecy that is unquestionably the most remarkable passage in the entire Bible, Daniel 9, 24 through 27. Now these verses are segmented. Verse 9, 24, the scope of the entire prophecy. Verse 9, 25, the 69 weeks. 9, 26, an interval between the 69th and 70th week. And 9, 27, the 70th week. So let's look at the scope. In 924, it says, 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression and make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. The idiom of a week. When it says a week, at that time the idiom of years was common in Israel. It was well known as the Sabbath of the land. It was worked. The land was worked for six years, and on the seventh year it was left to rest, so it would rebuild its nutrients. <clears throat> Plowed and harrowed, but left on its own for a period in order to restore the fertility as part of the crop rotation, or to avoid surplus production. Every seventh year, there was a year of rest. It was also the failure to obey these laws that led God sending them into captivity in, under the Babylonians. The Jews had been told what to do and how to do it, yet at some point their greediness overtook them, and year after year, seven after seven, they worked the crops. So the Lord allowed the Babylonians to take him. Note that the focus in this passage is upon thy people and upon thy holy city. That's the words right out of the verse. Uh, upon Israel in Jerusalem. This is not directed to the church. It's directed to the city itself. The scope of this prophecy includes a broad list of things clearly that have yet not been accomplished. Now, the first 29 weeks, a very specific prediction occurs in verse 25. 25 says, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto the Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks. The street shall be built again and the wall, even in troublesome times. This indicates a mathematical prophecy. The Jewish, the Babylonian calendars and the Jewish calendars used a 360 year day, not 365. 69 weeks of 360 day years totals 173,880 days. So we're talking about that span of time. In effect, Gabriel told Daniel that the interval between the commandment to rebuild Jerusalem until the presentation of Messiah the King would be 173,880 days, exactly. The Messiah the Prince in the King James translation is actually Mishiach Nagid, the Messiah, the King. Nagid is first used of Saul, the King. Now here's the bullseye. The commandment to restore and build Jerusalem was big, given by King Exerces, March 14th, 445 BC. The emphasis in the verse on the street and the wall. The street shall be built again, and the wall, even in troublesome times, that's the verse, was to avoid confusion with the earlier mandates confirmed to rebuilding the temple. 
When did the Messiah present himself as king? During the ministry of Jesus Christ, there are several occasions in which people attempted to promote him as king, but he carefully avoided them. Mine is not the hour, it has not come, was his statement in return. Now, the triumphal entry, what we're celebrating today as Palm Sunday. One day, Jesus meticulously arranges it. On this particular day, he rode into the city, riding on a donkey, deliberately fulfilling the prophecy by Zechariah that the Messiah would present himself as king in just that way. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, the king cometh unto thee. He is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass, and upon a colt, the foal of an ass. Zechariah 9.9. 9. Whenever we might easily miss the significance of what's going on here, the Pharisees come to our rescue. They felt that the overzealous crowd was blaspheming, proclaiming that Jesus was the Messiah King. However, Jesus endorsed it. They feared greatly that Jesus was bringing in something new, something that would take their jobs from them. Remember, they controlled the Jews, what they said went. They would lose their position and lose their religion, they felt, if this person was to be followed. And he endorsed the fact that what was said by Daniel, in the prophecy, by Zechariah, all would be true. I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. That's from Luke 19.40. He is explaining that if no one was there for him, the stones would have cried out as he entered into the city. This is the only occasion that Jesus presented himself as king. It occurred on April 6th, 32 AD. Only time, he says he's king. The procession of prophecy. When we examine the period between March 14th, 445 BC and April 6th, 32 AD, the correct and correct for leap years, once every four years, and realize that we're dealing with a 360 day year, we discovered that 173,880 days exactly to the very day when Jesus entered the city. So the prediction that Daniel makes in advance well before gets translated into Greek. Now in the Greek, with the exactness, there's no mistake, and this is all recorded with great facts about the exact time. Jesus fulfills that exact time himself. There's no way any human being could have put themselves in the position to be born at a specific time so that they would choose that exact day to come into the city and fulfill the need and blessing of a Messiah, which the Jews were awaiting. Now, the interval. There appears to be a gap between the 69th year, verse 25, and the 70th year, verse 27. In verse 26, and after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince, the Roman soldiers were the people of the prince. The prince of the air is the prince it refers to, Lucifer that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. And the end therefore shall be with a flood and unto the end of the war, desolations are determined. 62 weeks followed the initial seven. So verse 26 deals with events after 69th week, but before the 70th week. The events include the Messiah being killed and the city and sanctuary being destroyed. There is a remaining seven year period to be fulfilled. Revelation 619 is essentially a detail of that climactic period. As Jesus approached the city on the donkey, he also predicted the destruction 
of Jerusalem. Luke 19, verses 43 and 44. For days will come upon you, Israel, when your enemies will build an embankment around you, surround you and close you in on every side and level you and your children with you to the ground and they will not leave you one stone upon another because you did not know the time of your visitation. The Pharisees who studied the word, the Old Testament prior to Christ, knew of so many different things that were foretold, who this person would be, when they would come exactly. And if they believed the way they claimed to believe the word of God, they would have known exactly that Jesus Christ was the only one coming in as it was foretold 270 years before Christ on a donkey to the city, the Messiah would come. So for that, there's a punishment involved, the destruction of Jerusalem. The Messiah was, of course, executed at the crucifixion, but not for himself. The city and the sanctuary were destroyed 38 years later when Rome, Roman legions under Titus Vespasian leveled the city of Jerusalem in 70 AD, precisely as Daniel and Jesus had predicted. In fact, as one carefully examines Jesus' specific words, it appears that he held them accountable to know this astonishing prophecy in Daniel 9, because you did not know the time of your visitation. That's his statement. Now, what is this 70th week it makes reference to? There's a remaining seven-year period, which is the 70th week, to be fulfilled. This period is the most documented period in the entire Bible. The book of Revelation, chapters 6 through 19, is essentially a detailing of that climactic period. The interval between the 69th and 70th year week continues, but it is increasingly apparent that it may be over soon. The more one is familiar with the numerous climactic themes of end time prophecy, the more it deems that Daniel's 70th week is on our horizon. Amazing grace, isn't it? My mouth does get dry in this church. Now, let me give you a good reminder of some of our predecessors who have lived through time. We're stepping away from that period right now where we talked about what would take place a long time ago on this Sunday and the blessing of God. And we're also reminded of that 70th week as we get closer to that. And I'm not claiming that it's beginning at any point yet, but if you're aware of what the Bible teaches us in Revelation and we have Revelation in our Bibles for the sole purpose, it is a spot in the Bible, the only section, the only book of the Bible that says, if you read this, you'll receive a separate blessing. And that blessing is wisdom. To know beforehand what things are going to take place, to look out for them, to watch for the signs along the way. Well, that's that 70th year. Take a look around us right now. What are we dealing with? Let me go to something that's away from the sermon now, but what we're dealing with and try to give you a little comfort in the process. This is a story told by Denny Walker. I have to read it. It's a little bit on the long side. I talked with a man today, an 80-year-old man. I asked him if there was anything I can get him while this coronavirus scare was gripping America. He simply smiled, looked away and said, let me tell you what I need. I need to believe at some point this country, my generation fought for, I need to believe that this nation we handed safely to our children and their children. 
I need to know this generation will quit being a bunch of sissies. That they respect what they've been given. That they've earned what others sacrificed for. I wasn't sure where the conversation was going or if it was going anywhere at all. So I sat there quietly observing. You know, I was a little boy during World War II. Those were scary days. We didn't know if we were going to be speaking English, German, or Japanese at the end of the war. There was no certainty, no guarantees like Americans enjoy today. And no home went without sacrifice or loss. Every house, up and down every street had someone's, someone in harm's way. Maybe their daddy was a soldier. Maybe their son was a soldier. Maybe it was an uncle. Sometimes it was the whole damn family. Fathers, sons, uncles. Having someone you love sent off to war, well, it wasn't less frightening than it is today. It was so scary, scary as hell. If anything, it was more frightening. We didn't have battlefront news. We didn't have email or cell phones. You sent them away and you hoped and you prayed. You may not hear from them for months or if ever. Sometimes a mother was getting her son's letter the same day dad was confronting her over her child's death. And we sacrificed. You couldn't buy things. Everything was rationed. You were only allowed so much milk per month, only so much bread, toilet paper. Everything was restricted for the war effort. And what you weren't using, you didn't need, things you threw away. They were saved and sorted for the war effort. My generation was the original recycling movement in America. And we had viruses back then, serious viruses, things like polio, measles and such. It was nothing to walk to school and pass a house or two that was quarantined. We didn't shut down our schools. We didn't shut down our cities. We carried on without masks, without hand sanitizers. And do you know what? We persevered, we overcame. We didn't attack our president, we came together. We rallied around the flag for the war. Thick or thin, we were in it to win. And we would lose more boys in a half hour of combat than we lose in entire wars today. He slowly looked away again. Maybe I saw a small tear coming from the corner of his eye. Then he continued. Today, kids don't know sacrifice. They think sacrifice is not having coverage on the phone while they freely drive across the country. Today's kids are selfish and spoiled. In my generation, we looked out for our elders. We helped out with single moms whose husbands were either at war or dead from war. Today's kids rush this to the store buying everything they can, no concern for anyone but themselves. It's shameful the way Americans behave these days. None of them deserve the sacrifices their granddads made. So no, I don't need anything. I appreciate your offer. But I know I've been through worse things than this virus. But maybe I should be asking you, what can I do to help you? Do you have enough pop to get through this week? Enough steak? Will you be able to survive with 113 channels on your TV? I smile, fighting back a tear of my own, now humbled by a man in his 80s. All I could do was thank him for the history lesson, leave my number for emergency, and leave with my ego firmly tucked in my rear. I talked to a man today, a real man, an American man from an era long gone and forgotten. We will never understand the sacrifices. We will never fully earn their sacrifices, but we should work hard, much harder to learn about them, learn from them and give respect to them. Again, Denny Walker wrote this. Now there's a lot of 
people that'll hear something like this and say, that's way out of line, it's uncalled for. And some of the things I'd almost agree with you for. But I remember my aunt living with us for a long time and telling us old stories, down neck stories. And life was tougher. She told us one story and I talked with Chris this week about it. It was cute remembering. When she and my mother, her sister, obviously, would come home from school, they'd go past the railroad tracks in the ironbound section and pick up coal and bring it home. It was coal that fell off the sides of the coal carrying trains. No one said you couldn't take it. It was looked upon as just to stay there as waste. It helped heat the house. And sometimes they would take some of that coal and my grandfather would light it for them, surrounded by bricks to hold it in place like a mini oven. And while it heated, he would put on top of it a big potato wrapped in aluminum and it would cook it. And in the cold, they would sit there waiting for it to be done. And when it was, they would take it out of the aluminum and carefully wrap it with paper so they could hold it, split it in half and eat it. They were having a ball. My aunt said that was such a great thing to be able to do. She enjoyed it so much. It's a fond memory. Now, for most of us to hear that story, it's like, mm, I don't think I'd be doing that. If it was cold, I'd be in the house. But that's how these people grew up. They didn't have bathrooms in the house. They had outhouses. They didn't have electric. Many of them had candles to light the house. And then as time got closer and we got towards the war, there was electric in the house. But a TV was only on a few hours a day. Live news was a 15 minute show. So for these people that remember how tough it was, but they grew up during it and loved it, it was life. They turn around and look at people today and say, yeah, they complain about just about everything. I don't know if I'll be able to get the guy here this week to cut the grass for us. He's so busy because he's working. It's spring. How we look at everything is so different. So very different. So have an open heart. One that's kind for a person with that kind of an opinion. Don't think that these people are cranky old contagious. Lee. Tough. There are greater generation, older generation, and probably tougher generation. We're gonna get by without the sports games until they're allowed to come back. Without the entertainment, we're not gonna be able to go out and have dinner in a restaurant until this passes, but we'll get by. Let me read you the other side of the coin. Someone else that's very Loving, and we should be concerned with in how they approach this, what they see. Nyama John, age nine, from Chicago, Illinois. Yesterday, my mom was going to go to the grocery store, and she didn't really want me to come because it was dangerous. But my stepmom has a fever, so I couldn't go to my dad's house. So my mom had me take, took me to the store. She said to me, keep my hands in my pockets and I shouldn't touch anything at all. Mom had to wipe down the cart before she used it. Usually I help mom out by putting the food on the little conveyor belt so it could be checked out. But she said that I shouldn't help her this time. Sometimes some people were wearing those weird rubber glove things. And I saw one person wearing a mask. A lot of the aisles were really empty, especially when my mom went to go get some toilet paper. Everyone's stocking up on toilet paper and I don't get why. If you could rate me from one to 10 and one would be me totally calm, nothing to worry about at all, and 10 would be me totally freaking out, then I would probably be like a six or a seven. I'm really worried that my stepmom might have it. She might have the disease. Until my stepmom gets her test back, I can't go to my father's house. 
I really miss them, them and my sister. I've been wondering if my grandma, Dunkel, is okay. She's my great grandma and she's 104, which is kind of crazy. And that's why I'm worried about her because she is really one old, very old, and she could get very sick real soon. I always kind of wanted to be in a historical event, but nothing like this. This is a bad historical event. For homework last week, I read this article about a girl with anxiety. Anxiety is being scared because you don't know what's coming next. And yeah, I'm kind of having anxiety. To keep my mind off of that, I have been doing some assignments on Google Classroom that my teachers posted for me. I've been reading good books, The Wish Tree and Good Night Stories for Rebel Girls. I painted watercolors yesterday, that was fun. And I'm gonna bake chocolate chip cookies later today. I think that might help. It's a tough time for the young to comprehend exactly what's going on. We don't. On my way over here to the church, we were talking how odd things seem. This church a few weeks ago was packed with people enjoying each other, talking to each other, but remembering to bump elbows because something dangerous is starting. We at that time didn't think that the schools could possibly be closed for the rest of the year. Actually, it was weeks before Easter vacation, spring vacation as they call it now. People were looking forward to that work until then and then having a vacation, that's gonna be good. Lots of people book vacations to Disney and things like that, but none of that's happened. It's very odd. Outside, spring is coming. The trees are still blossoming. The cooler temperatures every so often are backing away and we're getting a taste of the warm spring temperatures. We look forward to that change, but there's something affecting the rest of the planet. All the people, not just here in this country, but people all over are feeling something abnormal, greatly abnormal. We need to put our faith in God. We need to lean on our faith in God. He's there for us. Let me read you a poem that I heard quite a few times Ravi Zacharias say, but it's so apropos. It's by Annie Johnson. The words and the truths for us are as beautiful. He giveth more grace when the burdens grow greater. He sendeth more strength when the labors increase. He added affliction, he addeth his mercy. To multiplied trials, he mul multiplied peace. When we have exhausted our store of endurance, when our strength has failed or the day is half done, when we reach to the end of our hoarded resources, our Father's full giving has only begun. His love has no limit. His grace has no measure. His power no boundary known unto man. For out of his infinite riches in Jesus, he giveth and giveth and giveth again. When I think of all the verses in the Bible, probably my favorite is Romans 8, 28. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. And he goes on in 29 to say, for God knew his people in advance and he chose them to become like his son 
so that his sons would be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. God the Father is telling us here that we're a brother and a sister to Jesus. That Jesus that we talked about making his entry in today into the city where he knew he would be rejected by many. He also knew that after his three years of teaching as much as he could, he would be put to the cross. He knew what he was doing and still went ahead and did it. How many of us would have been able to have the courage to go ahead with what was on his mind? When we talk about having something bothering us, that's why we're not doing things right. Don't mind me, I'm fumbling over things because I got a lot on my mind. Jesus had three years of a lot on his mind that he was going to die for us. He continued forward. He even says to us how much he loved us, that he would die for us, that we could be brothers and sisters with him. God the Father loves us so much. But if we don't have faith and put our faith in him at these times, these times will terrify us. Nothing can happen to me that's not in the chosen path that God's put before me. And that's for each one of you also. I'm not saying don't think that this isn't dangerous, this virus, which it is. It's a killer. But I'm saying to you, don't look at it every day as it's going to kill you. Yesterday, I heard about a 101-year-old man that had just gone through the virus and survived it without any problems. So the indiscretion of this disease shows you that at 101, it didn't affect him. Who knows if it's gonna affect any one of us? But if it does, that's in God's hands. He just told us in Romans 8, 28, that he'll take care of anything. Anything that occurs will work out for the better in our lives. Have faith in him. Enjoy this Easter season. Try to look very much on the bright side. I'm not saying you have to walk around with a silly smile on your face, although that would be nice. Enjoy life each and every day. Live life as if you only have 30 days left and you'll appreciate so much more. At this time, let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you for your word and the blessing that it is in our lives. Help us to take it to heart, to be satisfied with each and every bit of your word, that your word is what strengthens us and shows us our future. And we ask you, Lord, to bless us during this time when we need your help so much and help the body of Christ throughout the world, especially those that are trying so hard to help others and to bring others to you. We ask this in your son's holy and precious name, the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Lord, we thank you for all you've blessed us with. And we look forward to worshiping you this Sunday and each and every Sunday that's in our future. Keep those in mind right now in the church that need a blessing, need special help. Keep John and Sharon in mind. John's going through tough times now. He knows that he needs to get some work done, but that's being placed on hold as most things, most surgeries are placed on hold. 
and we continue to pray for the whole body of the church. In Jesus' name, amen.